Hi guys, I am from Med Miracle and today we are going to talk about radiology which is a small yet important subject of the final prof examinations. So radiology is a subject that is feared by almost all the students who are taking the PG examination due to the wide scope of the subject and the variety of image based questions which are coming from it. So today I am going to guide you as to how to better approach this subject and highlight the various important topics that come from it. So radiology is better divided into two parts, first being general radiology and second being systemic radiology. So my advice is that systemic radiology be dealt with topics from different subjects while you're studying them. For example, when you're reading neurology, it's better that you read the different aspects of neuroradiology along with it and so on and so forth for different topics in the different subjects. And as we go on with the video, I will tell you how to what are the important topics and different aspects of radiology and where they should be read from. So now we start with general radiology. So the first topic that comes up from general radiology is a few basics of radiation and electromagnetic spectrum. So the most frequently asked question in AIMS examination is which imaging investigation involves the use of ionizing radiation and which investigation doesn't. So the easy way to remember this is that there are only two modalities which are currently used that involve the use of non-ionizing radiation which are first ultrasound, second MRI. Thermography used to be an old technique that involved the use of non-ionizing radiation which can come up as an option and confuse students. So one needs to remember that ultrasound and MRI are practically the only two investigations which do not involve the use of ionizing radiation. So an indirect question that can be answered using this principle is that whenever a child is asked in a question, one should always think of these two modalities as possible answers because one doesn't want to expose the child to excess radiation. So that is one indirect advantage of this fact. Also to confuse the students options such as Doppler which is nothing but a part of an ultrasound investigation can also be given to confuse students. Uh, the special techniques of MRI such as MRCP can also be given to confuse in the options which involve the use of non-ionizing radiations. So this is about this fact. Coming on to the second option that is the adverse effects of radiation in legislation. So these are theoretical questions which are very important for all India examination. So for legislation AERB guidelines. So one needs to refer the current AERB guidelines for occupational workers, general population and pregnant females. So there are specific guidelines for each of the three and one needs to know the cutoff limits for the radiation exposure limit for all the three groups. Adverse effects of radiation such as stochastic effects and non-stochastic effects and what constitutes the two needs to be known. Next important topic is X-ray tube. So the various parts of the X-ray tube, what constitutes the cathode, what constitutes the anode, what is thermionic emission, what is anode heal effect? These are important questions which can come up from X-ray tube. What is a focal spot? What is the size of the focal spot? These are important questions which have come in past from X-ray tube. Contrast agent is another very, very important question. A lot of questions from Gipmer in the re recent years have come up from use of contrast agents. So contrast agents, that is iodinated contrast agents, MRI contrast agents, and in recent years, CEUS, that is contrast enhanced ultrasound, and the contrast agents used in that are hot favorite questions. So one needs to know CEUS in detail because it is an upcoming topic and questions can come up from this. Next important topic from general radiology is about the doses. 
so the various doses involved in radiology and their units is a very very important topic and it needs to be revised multiple times to remember it efficiently and not get confused so just for ready reference these are the four doses that one needs to know and what are the SI unit and the old units used for these one also needs to know the relation between them and also one needs to remember that equivalent dose is the most effective way of knowing the radiation to human so equivalent dose is the most useful information out of all these other values ultrasound transducers is another frequently asked question in AIMS and All India examinations. So one needs to know that basically there are four types of ultrasound transducers or probes which have different frequency. So frequency will determine the resolution and the penetration of the ultrasound beam that is how deep you can image the tissue. So higher the frequency of the probe the higher the resolution that will be provided but the resolution will be at an expense of decreased penetration that is a low depth image shall be provided for example when we use a high frequency probe we can see very well for example this is the thyroid gland which is imaged with a linear probe which is a high frequency probe so a thyroid is a superficial structure so it is very well visualized with the linear probe which has a limited depth but the resolution is very high so this is the linear probe which has a high frequency in the range of 7 to 15 megahertz so one needs to remember that ultrasound is used for med medically used frequency that is from 2 to 20 megahertz so the high frequency probe that is the linear probe will image with a frequency of 7 to 15 and it has a higher resolution and a limited depth the curvy linear probe which is frequently used for examination of the abdomen or the pelvis has a frequency in the range of 3.5 to 5 so the higher depth that is achieved is at expense of a lower resolution compared to the high frequency linear probes so these are the two basic probes these other variant probes have a frequency in between these two this is the endocavitary probe which is used for endovaginal examination or endorectal examination so this has a frequency in between the two which is from 5 to 10 so it is higher than the curvy linear probe but it is not as high as the linear probe this is a recent modification of ultrasound probes which is also called as a sectoral probe or a small footprint probe so it has a very small footprint compared to the other probes so this has a frequency in the range of 2 to 8 megahertz so the main advantage or the utility of the sectoral probe is in imaging of the heart or in imaging in between the intercostal spaces so the small footprint allows it to be used to scan in between the intercostal uh, intercostal ribs that is the ribs otherwise provide a lot of posterior caustic shadowing due to the bones but if we have a small probe that can be kept in between two ribs it will help us image the underlying lung which is very difficult with the other kind of probes which have a higher field of view which will definitely involve scanning between two ribs which will not allow visualization beneath it next important topic is MRI sequences and their identification so this is where most of the students face a challenge as to recognize what is a T1 weighted image, what is a T2 weighted image and what are the other special Im imaging sequences that are used in MRI. So first of all a very familiar rule that is World War II that is water is white on T2 weighted image. So if you see these ventricles 
the CSF within them is bright here, but it is dark in the other two sequences. So wherever CSF appears bright, it is definitely a T2 weighted image. So then a question arises, how do we distinguish a T1 weighted image from a fluid suppressed image? That is flare, where the CSF is attenuated. So flare stands for fluid attenuated inversion recovery sequence. So it is nothing but a sequence wherein the CSF is suppressed so that we can identify edema in the parts of the brain better. So how do we distinguish these two? So this brings us to another important concept in MRI. What are the substances which appear bright on T1? This is a very important topic and it can be asked in a variety of ways. So it's a good idea to remember what are the uh, structures or substances which are bright on T1. Most important is fat. I'm not saying fat is dark on T2. It can be bright on T2 weighted, but it is always bright on T1 weighted sequence. So fat is bright on T1. Hemorrhage or blood products is bright on T1. Melanin. So you can have an image, an MRI T1 weighted image of the eye where you see that there is a choroidal deposit which is a T1 hyper intense lesion. So that is a melanoma, a choroidal melanoma which is a common location for melanoma to arise. Next is gadolinium. So gadolinium is the MRI contrast agent which is used. So a post gadolinium sequence or a post contrast sequence is always a T1 weighted image. This is a potential question that can be asked. So these are the four things which are bright on T1. So when you see a T1 bright lesion in the kidney, it can be an angiomyolipoma or a lipoma of the kidney. So there was a question in Ames May 17 exam which showed a CT which was showing an angiomyolipoma. So a similar question can be asked on an MRI. So it will be T1 bright. So fat is T1 bright. Anything that is undergoing hemorrhage will be T1 bright. Melanin will be T1 bright and gadolinium will be T1 bright. So coming back to MRI sequence identification, we can see that white matter which constitutes fat that is oligodendrocytes is bright here on the T1 weighted. But on the flare, which is a modification of the T2 weighted sequence, we can see that the gray matter, that is this part here, is brighter than the white matter. So this is how we recognize that this is the flare sequence and this is the T1 weighted sequence by looking at the gray matter and the white matter. Another important topic from MRI which can be asked and used to be asked previously are the various contraindications of MRI. The other important part is a few newer sequences or the special sequences which are performed in MRI. So we looked at flare. Another sequence is stir. So stir is a fat suppression image. This is mainly used in musculoskeletal applications wherein we can wherein we can visualize the bone marrow edema better on the fat suppressed image that is the stir image diffusion weighted images is a very important topic and one needs to know what are substances substances which restrict diffusion and the substances which don't so here is an important trick to remember what are the imaging appearances of fat and fluid these are the two most important things one needs to know when we are looking at the different images on CT, MRI or ultrasound. So fat has a very specific appearance on all the three of them. Starting from CT, fat will appear dark or black on a CT scan. On a T1 weighted image as we've already talked about, fat will be bright. On an ultrasound, fat will be bright or hyper echoic. So we use the term hyper or hypoechoic on ultrasound, hyper or hypo intense on T1 weighted image or a T2 weighted image that is on MRI and hyper dense or hypo dense on a CT scan. So to summarize, fat is hypo dense on CT. It is extremely black. So if you look at the subcutaneous fat, it will be black. It is bright on a T1 weighted image and it is hyperechoic on ultrasound. 
so this rem remembering these facts will help us identify any type of a fatty mass anywhere it will also help us identify fatty liver so if you look at the liver and you are asked a question whether the liver appears normal or not so you can look if the fat up if the liver appears darker on a ct scan it could be a fatty liver moving on to the fluid so fluid or edema will be gray on ct so if you look at a simple cyst which consists of fluid it will appear gray homogeneously gray on a ct scan it will appear bright on t2 as we already know by the rule world war 2 so it will be bright on t2 so any kind of edema whether it's vasogenic edema or cytotoxic edema or interstitial edema it will appear bright on a t2 weighted image but the way to distinguish these three edema will be by diffusion weighted image so this is a very important concept which we often miss the dwi that is diffusion weighted image restricted diffusion or bright on diffusion weighted image will be something that has cytotoxic edema the other two types of edema won't show diffusion restriction so an acute stroke which has cytotoxic edema will appear bright on diffusion weighted image or it will show restricted diffusion on an ultrasound a fluid containing cyst or fluid anywhere else will appear dark that is anechoic so that is how we look at a cyst on an ultrasound one needs to remember that ultrasound will be the investigation of choice to distinguish cystic versus solid no matter how advanced we get in our imaging modality we can never go wrong that ultrasound will be the most important modality for distinguishing a cystic versus a solid lesion now we begin with systemic radiology so the first is cns or head and neck radiology so the various frequently asked topics here are first is when to do which investigation so first of all ultrasound is not very frequently used in cns and head and neck radiology so most of the occasions you can rule that out as an option so coming on to ct and mri so when to do an nct when to do a contrast and an ct and when to do an mri so for all practical purposes an nct is always indicated in an acute presentation in an emergency setting or in a trauma setting where we are suspecting hemorrhage so hemorrhage will appear hyperdense on a ct scan and it will appear hyper intense on a t1 weighted image as we've already talked about but in an acute setup since mri is a time taking in investigation it is not readily available nct is usually the investigation of choice when you want to rule out a hematoma in a stroke patients before starting the thrombolytic therapy so nct has to be kept in mind as an answer when you're looking at an emergency situation or in a trauma setting a cct has niche indications such as meningitis meningoencephalitis that is any infection that is suspected when you're suspecting a tumor or a mass lesion so these are the various indications of a cct mri is usually used as a problem solving modality so ct forms an investigation that is done initially and then once a finding is noted an mri is done because of its better contrast resolution it is then followed up and the variety of sequences that is offered by mri to further characterize the lesion we do an mri or we do an mri where the ct is normal and the clinical problem is still unsolved so these are the various investigations the next important topic are these two infections that is tb which is extremely common in our setting and neurocystic circus and how to distinguish these two next is hematomas the various different kinds of hematomas this is something that is expected by every pg exam taker that one needs to know that is edh how to distinguish edh how to distinguish sdh 
how to recognize SAH and intracranial hemorrhage and what are the differences between each of them. So I'll be talking about this at the end of the presentation. Next important topic is neurocutaneous syndromes. So the various neurocutaneous syndromes that is NF1, NF2, VHL, Sturge-Weber. These are very very important topics and these have questions which can be which can be coming from medicine, dermat, any kind of a manifestation can be given and you can be asked to link the various imaging features or the clinical or the dermatological pictures to the diagnosis. So one needs to know the various imaging manifestations of all these neurocutaneous syndromes. This is yet another important topic from neuroradiology from which various questions from JIPMER in the recent years and AIMS in the recent years have come up. What are the various causes of intracranial calcification? So I have given this table as a ready reference. You can pause the video here and note these down. So what are the causes of physiological calcification? The most important being pineal gland calcification, choroid plexus calcification, Fox calcification other various causes which have been asked in various forms most commonly as to which of the following tumors shows intracranial calcification except and a combination of multiple tumors are given so i have provided you with a ready reference that these are the various tumors which show intracranial calcification you can go through this table and look at the various other causes this here that is metabolic causes is also very important part of this moving on to chest radiology so the most important aspect here is the anatomy so the anatomy of the chest on an x-ray and on a ct especially the mediastinal structures on both ct and the mediastinal outline on a chest x-ray this is the most important part. So one needs to know what constitutes which boundary of the chest x-ray. And this will also help us identify which cardiac chamber is enlarged on a chest x-ray. So one needs to remember that the right heart border on a chest x-ray is formed by the right atrium. The right ventricle forms the inferior border of the cardiac contour. The left ventricle forms almost the entire left heart border with a small part superiorly which is constituted by the auricle. So the important part is that left atrium does not constitute to the heart border on a frontal chest x-ray. It will be seen on a lateral chest x-ray. So if the left atrial enlargement is there, it won't be seen on a frontal chest x-ray. Next are the various imaging appearances which are known by the various signs of congenital heart diseases. So this is an important topic and needs to be remembered. But I still stress that the normal anatomy on a chest x-ray and normal anatomy that is cross-sectional anatomy on a CT chest is very important and a lot of indirect questions can come up from it. So moving on further cordially that is the abdominal radiology which involves the GIT and the genitourinary tract radiology. So again cross-sectional anatomy especially on a CT scan here plays a very very important part. So this is one of the basic things you need to know before answering any question on abdominal radiology. Other important topics is common liver tumors and their imaging appearance. So most important of these are HCC that is hepatocellular carcinoma. So the thing to remember here is they show arterial enhancement and venous washout. So these are the two key things you need to remember for the imaging of hepatocellular carcinoma. Other important liver tumors are hemangiomas and FNH. There are a variety of liver tumors and their radiology but that is beyond the scope and but one needs to know what an hemangioma looks like on a CT on an MRI and what an FNH with its typical central scar looks like on imaging. Next is common renal tumors. 
so may 17 aims exam a question on aml that is angioma lipoma of the kidney was asked various options such as rcc oncocytoma was given so one needs to know the imaging appearances of common renal tumors and common liver tumors next is barium studies so a lot of questions that especially image based questions have come from barium so these are the various things you need to know so achalasia ca esophagus zenkers diverticulum gitb and inflammatory bowel disease especially crohn's disease so the barium signs and the appearances with their images needs to be revised for image based questions next is ivp so a few facts about ivp and the ivp appearances of the following model of the following conditions needs to be known first of all horseshoe kidney with its specific signs duplex moiety the drooping lily sign crossed fused ectopia which is a favorite question of aims examiners an image of a crossed fused ectopia wherein both the kidneys will lie on one side for example if this is an abdominal x-ray this is the spine we will see that in the ivp both the kidneys lie on the same side however the ureters drain in the contralateral and that is the normal side of the bladder so this is what crossed fused ectopia looks like and it is a hot favorite of the aims professors calculus how a calculus appears on an abdominal x-ray that is it appears hyper because of the calcification it appears hypertense or radio opaque how a calculus appears on a ct an important fact is that all calculi appear radio opaque on a CT except one that is Indinavir which appears lucent on a CT as well so what are the calculi which appear lucent on an x-ray and opaque on an x-ray is a list that one needs to remember however the same list does not apply to CT and Indinavir is the only calculi which appears lucent on a CT so moving on a appearance of a urethroceal which is also called as the adder head appearance posterior urethral valve which is seen on an mc study that is a micturating cystourethrogram gutb so an important fact is that ivp is still the modality which picks up gutb at its earliest so there are very few in indications of ivp in this age one of which is gutb and second is to identify various congenital anomalies so these are the congenital anomalies as i've already described and gutb so these two remain the only indications of ivp in this era of ct and mri papillary necrosis so a recent question in jipmer golf ball appearance on an ivp so papillary necrosis polycystic kidney disease and the signs so the various ivp signs and the modalities and the conditions which are associated with these signs and the images must be revised so these are the important topics in abdomen radiology so moving on to few miscellaneous topics that includes msk radiology pediatric radiology and breast radiology so starting with msk so most of these topics have been covered in orthopedics video as well by mad miracle so the two important topics from msk the first is no doubt bone tumors which is a very very important topic and radiology will be given when any question on bone tumor is being asked so bone tumors have to be approached very systematically wherein the age the location of the tumor as described in this image whether it's located in the diaphysis metaphysis or the epiphysis which will help you narrow down the differentials so ecg is the mnemonic that is commonly used that is epiphysis is there are two main differentials one is chondroblastoma and one is a gct so these are practically the only two diagnoses when a tumor arises in an epiphysis the lesions which occur in metaphysis and diaphysis these need to be remembered and age specific diagnosis 
so the two most important factors in bone tumor are age and location the next would be the morphology of the bone tumor whether it is well defined expansile geographic lesion that is a well defined lesion a permeative lesion that is it is permeating into the rest of the bone with ill defined margins and a moth eaten kind of appearance so these two are typically associated with an aggressive tumor and a geographic lytic lesion is usually associated with a benign lesion so bone tumor radiology is a very very important topic and has been asked multiple times in aims and gipmar examination with image based questions next important topic is arthritis how to distinguish inflammatory from non inflammatory arthritis it's a very very important topic and images can be given that is x rays can be given for arthritis you may be asked the diagnosis ankylosing spondylitis with a question in may 17 a very very important topic and we'll talk about it in the next slide infections especially acute and chronic osteomyelitis tb arthritis the images of these are very important next this is an overlapping topic of ms scan pediatric radiology are the different metabolic diseases which have been asked multiple times the various signs of rickets scurvy hyperparathyroidism very very important and hypothyroidism how to distinguish primary from secondary hpt very very important epiphyseal dysgenesis with hypothyroidism very very important named fractures of the upper limb lower limb which have been dealt by apoor sir in a separate video on both these topics is a must next is dysplasias so there are a wide variety of dysplasias but the ones which need to be know the ones which we need to know are chondroplasia and mucopelvic sclerosis the imaging appearance of the two and the various signs associated with the two very very important next coming on to breast radiology by rads categorization very very important so i'll just take a minute to focus on ankylosing spondylitis which is a very recent question in the may 17 in aims examination and various questions in all india have been asked from this topic so first of all the hallmark of ankylosing spondylitis is sacroiliitis which is usually neglected because of the various named spinal changes so sacroiliitis is one of the earliest features of ankylosing spondylitis that is picked up earliest on an mri so this is how it looks like this is the last stage of ankylosing spondylitis sacroiliitis wherein there is complete ankylosis of these si joints so it start it's usually bilaterally symmetrical starts on the iliac side first and it usually ends in this appearance that is complete ankylosis and sclerosis of the si joints any atypical involvement that is unilateral asymmetrical involvement or sacral involvement more than iliac involvement will favor diagnosis such as infections like tb so moving on so the various spinal changes of ankylosing spondylitis are as follows so the small erosions which are picked up at an early stage at the vertebral body corner are called the romanus lesion later these erosions turn into sclerosis which is called the shiny corner sign eventually it results in squaring of vertebral bodies and there are marginal sin desmophytes which form at the edges these are these marginal sin desmophytes which occur due to the ossification of the annulus fibrosus so this is the intervertebral disc this is the pulposus and these are the annulus fibrosus so when there is ossification of the edges it appears as though the vertebrae have developed these sin desmophytes which are bridging sin desmophytes which bridge the vertebrae this ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament also called the dagger sign on an ap x-ray so the various sign that is romanus lesion shiny corner sign squaring of the vertebral body or the bamboo spine 
or the dagger spine sign are all associated with ankylosing spondylitis. Moving on to the next important topic which is emergency medicine radiology. I feel that this is the most important part from which various questions have come up through the years. This is something that should not be missed by any person who is attempting the PG examination because the examiners expect that the students have attended the clinical rounds, they have attended the casualty rounds and they should not miss these emergency radiology findings on imaging. So what are the various things one needs to know and I'll be focusing this in detail because I feel that this is something which shouldn't be missed and, and so many questions have come up in the recent years which they, where they've given the x-ray or the ultrasound or the CT image they've asked to ask the diagnosis. So first is pneumothorax, where pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, pleural effusion, pulmonary embolism, where even a CTPA can be given, pneumoperitoneum, May 17 exam, bowel obstruction, so how to distinguish small bowel from large bowel obstruction, volvulus, could be sickle volvulus or sigmoid volvulus, appendicitis, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, stroke, aortic dissection and aneurysms. So these are the conditions for which imaging is essential and one needs to know the appearance of all these. Other questions that can come up are investigation of choice or what is the first investigation you will do when a patient presents with so and so condition. So one needs to think as to what condition they're talking about in the clinical description in the question and then go on to think about what will be the best or the first investigation that one goes for. So usually in an emergency setup, ultrasound is the most important modality that is used initially in the surgical emergency where patient presents with the one of the following conditions that is appendicitis, cholecystitis, pancreatitis. In a trauma setup, for example, the first investigation is usually an NCCT head that is done for any patient with suspected head injury. E-FAST, lot of important questions from E-FAST are coming in recent years, especially in the All India examination. So what constitutes an E-FAST examination? The full form of E-FAST, very, very important. So now we'll quickly revise the imaging appearance of various emergency conditions which one definitely needs to know. So this is a finding which you cannot afford to miss for the patient or for yourself in the exam. This is free air under the diaphragm, should never be missed. So this is the free air under the diaphragm. When you see it on the right side, it is definitely pneumoperitoneum. When you see it on the left side, it's also more likely to be pneumoperitoneum, but you have to rule out a gastric bubble first. Right, so free air under the diaphragm, very, very important, constitutes a pneumoperitoneum. A CT is usually done next to see where the air is coming from. But if the patient is unstable, he is taken up straight into the OT if this finding is seen on an X-ray. The next important condition, which cannot be missed, which is a lethal condition for a patient if missed. So this is what is called as the continuous diaphragm sign. If you notice carefully, there is this thin loosened streak, that is this thin dark streak which you can see outlining this mediastinal border as well as the diaphragm. On the lateral film, you can better see this ring sort of a thing here which is called the ring around the bronchus sign. This is the continuous diaphragm sign and this is seen in pneumomediastinum. Shouldn't be missed. Pneumomediastinum. So another important emergency condition that came in an AIMS 2016 exam. Very, very important. So this is what is called an air fluid level. So you see air above and fluid below and there is this horizontal level which is called an air fluid level. 
so the diagnosis here you, if you notice here there are no bronchovascular markings which is indicative of a pneumothorax and this portion constitutes a hydro component because of the air fluid level horizontal level that you can see here so this is a hydro pneumothorax other areas where you can see an air fluid level are lung abscesses so there is an air component here and a soft tissue or a fluid component here so another related thing you need to know here is that soft tissue and fluid cannot be separated on an x-ray chest x-ray or any other x-ray you need a ct or an mri to distinguish the two so what are the radiographic densities that are appreciated on an x-ray so there are only five densities so this can be a potential aims question a favorite of the aims examiners what are the radiographic densities that can be appreciated on an x-ray first is air which is the darkest area on an x-ray you can see here air second is soft tissue or fluid third is fat fourth is bones and fifth is metal these are the five radiographic densities which are appreciated on an x-ray another important concept which is about pneumothorax so in an e-fast examination in trauma setting pneumothorax is one of the modalities which is looked for on an ultrasound an m mode ultrasound image is used for this so on a b mode image that is the normal grayscale image that we use there is something called a sliding sign which is seen when sliding is present means there is no pneumothorax so when an m mode is used to confirm the presence or absence of pneumothorax this is the imaging appearance so in a normal lung there is this sign called the seashore sign which is seen which appears as a seashore that is this is the shore and this is the water so there is a difference where the area where there is no motion and the area where there is motion of the underlying lung so this is the seashore sign which indicates a normal lung however when there is pneumothorax it appears as a barcode you can see that there is no difference it all appears as a line this is called barcode or a stratosphere sign which is used for diagnosis of pneumothorax apart from the absence of sliding on a b mode image so this is a very very important aspect apart from that one needs to know the diagnosis of x-ray pneumothorax the various signs on frontal erect as well as supine position that is the deep sulcus sign very very important this is another important image based question which can come in the exam so here if you see in the left mythorax you see these air filled lucencies that is these things which appear as bowel loops so if you see that there is mediastinal shift the heart is pushed to the right side and the left heart left uh, hemithorax is completely occupied by these bowel like things so the diagnosis here is that of a diaphragmatic hernia which can be traumatic or it can be congenital based on the setting so a diagnosis of a diaphragmatic hernia is made by looking at these lucencies in the hemithorax which look like bowel loops and if you see the normal gastric shadow is not seen here moving on to the emergency conditions in head trauma so this is the most important topic in head radiology in emergency setup how to distinguish an edh from an sdh so this lenticular appearance is typical for an edh another thing edh will never cross sutures whereas an sdh will have this typical crescentric appearance and we cross the sutures so this is how you distinguish the two edh is usually caused by underlying fracture and is associated with arterial injury whereas an sdh is usually associated with underlying venous injury 
this appearance here we can see that this is a bright thing so we talked about it earlier blood appears hyperdense as you can also see here blood acute blood appears hyperdense on a ct on an ncct image so here if you see these circle spaces and these cisternal outlines are all filled with these white things so this is how an sh appears along with this there is also transplantorial herniation which is noted here so an imaging appearance of sh sdh edh is very very important moving on to nuclear medicine and radiotherapy the important topics here are first of all the commonly used isotopes and their half lives a very frequently asked exam question in all india pg examination very very important and this is a very volatile topic and needs to be revised the last minute preparation the various modes of rt teletherapy versus brachytherapy and the newer modalities a few important tumors and the role of chemo and radiotherapy that is which tumors are particularly chemo or radio sensitive or chemo or radio resistant one need one doesn't need to know all the tumors but just the few important ones this is a very important question for all india again tissue radio sensitivity we'll talk about it in the next slide what tissues are more radio sensitive what tissues are less less radio sensitive again an important aims question examples of radio protectors radio sensitizers this list very important recent question in aims examination moving on to nuclear medicine one needs to know about a few basic scans and the principle and the use mainly the use where they where we involve the use of nuclear medicine mibg very important dotanox scan which is usually used in neuroendocrine tumor a favorite question of aims examiners dotanox involves the use of gallium 68 and it is used for net particularly pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and it involves the use of somatostatin receptors so this is a very important question and another important question is that insulinomas are generally the only nets which can not show uptake on dotanox so this is a potential aims question a very very important topic cesta mebi scan and the various radio isotopes that are used for the scan very very important so now moving on to the last minute revision so these are the topics that one needs to revise in the last week before any examination because these are volatile topics yet very very important topics and one cannot afford to get these questions wrong because they are, these are usually straight forward questions and only test the memory of the candidate so the radiation units one needs to have a handy list of all these topics which we shall enumerate in all our videos in different subjects so for radiology these are the topics radiation units classification of contrast agents specially iodinated contrast agents also briefly a few words about gadolinium based contrast agents in mri and specially a recent hot topic that is contrast enhanced ultrasound and sonoview which is the contrast agent used the radio isotopes and their half lives this is something that should be revised on the last day because the numbers are very volatile and one needs to know this the various tissue radio sensitivity of various structures which i shall cover in the next slide the tissue radio sensitivity so now let's divide this into two where questions are mostly asked which is the most radio sensitive which is the least radio sensitive this is a frequently asked question in all india pg examination so let's divide this into various categories first is which stage of cell division is most susceptible to radiation so g to m is the most susceptible if not given in the option m that is the mitotic phase least sensitive is the s phase organ so the most sensitive organ are the gonads or the bone marrow 
and the least be central nervous system which is the most sensitive cell type so all the metabolically active cells are more susceptible whereas quiescent cells are least susceptible which blood cell is more susceptible so a lymphocyte is the most susceptible however a platelet is the least susceptible which retinal layer is the most susceptible so the vascular endothelium is the most susceptible whereas the retinal pigment epithelium is the least radio sensitive so this is a very high yield table and needs to be remembered so i have covered a variety of questions on the same topic which have come up in various examinations through the years in this one table and this needs to be remembered another question which tumors are particularly radio sensitive and particularly not radio sensitive so just a brief important list or an important concept to remember is that the small round cell tumors are all very very important and are most susceptible to both radio and chemotherapy so small round cell tumors which are constituted by wills tumor or lymphoma or seminoma are all very susceptible to radiation and chemotherapy whereas tumors like osteosarcoma hcc melanoma ca pancreas are all very less susceptible to radiation or chemotherapy and are rarely given radiotherapy and this is a list of the half lives of the various isotopes that have been asked in various examinations so this is a ready reference list that should be revised i urge you to take a picture do whatever but do remember this list very very important revise this on the last day before your examination because especially for all india because if you get a qu direct question from this topic it should not be done wrong so this the half lives of various isotopes is a very very important topic so with this we end our presentation on the important topics of radiology i hope you liked the video please put forward your suggestions which will help us improve our videos and solve your queries thank you